from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight I want you to turn with me to the 11th chapter of Matthew. The 11th chapter of Matthew. Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want to speak tonight on the university of life. I want to speak to young people as well as older people on the subject of the university of life. Now we usually think of this text that a pastor will take and use at Labor Day. But that's wrong in one sense and yet in another sense it is correct. But this is an invitation to men and women who are exhausted with the search for truth. Jesus said you've been searching for truth, you're tired. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You found it. The search ends with me. Now, at this university we're talking about tonight, you can fail, but you can never drop out. All over the world, people are beginning to ask questions about where civilization is headed. One of the foreign experts left Washington in, his, in despair this past summer and went back to the university to teach, and he was asked why. And he said, sometimes I get the feeling I'm sitting on a hilltop watching two trains racing toward each other on the same track. Vice Premier Deng of China stated recently, this past summer, that World War III is inevitable and independent of man's will in this decade. A British editorial said recently, the world is on a collision course with disaster. Now, when we come back to America and see the affluence of America, I also read and hear about the new surge of problems that our affluency has created. Psychologists, economists, clergy, politicians are dealing with social and moral problems on a scale that they've never had to deal with before. For example, the marriage breakups, even among so-called professing Christians, some of them well-known Christians in our newspapers even today. Married women having adulterous affairs has tripled in the last five years. But the price they pay is escalating drug addiction, alcoholism, and suicide. Racial tensions, we thought the race problem in America was settled. It's not settled. Look at Miami or Philadelphia this past summer. The psalmist said, and I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then I would fly away and rest. Have you ever felt that way? You'd like to fly away from life and rest. You'd like to get out of that kitchen and rest. You'd like to get out of that job and rest. You'd like to fly away somewhere. Thousands of people out east come to Nevada and to California thinking that they're going to find it here. And they may find something here, but they find wonderful air here in Reno, I'll tell you that. They find beautiful mountains here. And they find a lot of activity here. But the real thing they're searching for is God. Because you see, they were made in the image of God. And without God, their hearts are restless till they come to know God. You can never find true rest until you know God. And you that are watching by television, if you want to find peace with God and rest in your own souls, call that number on your screen right now and let somebody talk to you. As many people here will do later on in the evening. You see, the psalmist longing to escape has become the cry of the world today. The psalmist also said, I'm full of heaviness and looked for some to take pity, but there was none and for comforters, but I found none. The Bible also says, but the eyes of the wicked will fail and escape will elude them. Their hope will become a dying gasp. No way out. Jesus said, I am the way out. He said, there's only one way to escape, one way out, and I'm it. You have to come by the way of the cross and the empty tomb and find reconciliation with God and peace in your heart and joy in your heart that you have lost. And how many of you are trying to escape? You've come out here from somewhere else to escape all the rigors of life somewhere else, but you haven't really found it yet. You haven't found that joy and that peace that you thought you'd find or that sense of fulfillment. You don't have the answer to the questions, where did you come from? What is life all about? Where are you going when you die? You don't have those answers yet. You can find it tonight by coming to Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus said, 
learn of me. It's a picture of Jesus Christ as the great professor at the university. He's the greatest teacher that ever was. The Bible says he taught them as one having authority. He spoke with authority. You never find Jesus saying, I hope this is the way. I think this is the way. The Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. There are many ways in life that seem right, but the end is death, destruction, judgment, and hell. And Jesus warned about that. Jesus said, I am the way. Now, most of the world would agree that he's the greatest teacher that ever lived. And so tonight, I want you to sit for a few moments at the feet of the world's greatest teacher. In most American universities and colleges, they have what is called required courses and elective courses. Now, in life, there are certain required courses. What are they? There are three. Three required courses and three elective courses that I want you to think about tonight. The first required course is life itself. Philosophy means the study of life and ideas concerning life. And one of the most discussed new books published last summer was The Philosophers, in which 20 of the most influential philosophers of the Western world in modern times are psychoanalyzed as to the amount of fulfillment that they themselves enjoy. And it, it, so demon, it demonstrated that all 20 of them that they studied were characterized by loneliness and anxiety. You see, we did not choose to be born. We were not consulted about living. And there's nothing you can do to stop living. We did not choose where to be born. We did not choose what color of skin we have. There's no escaping life. Oh, you say, I can commit suicide. That doesn't get you out of life. You only kill the body. Your soul, your spirit is eternal. It lives on. So you cannot escape by suicide. Suicide does not end at all, as some people think. Yes, you're required to live. How do you face life? What resources do you have to call upon when the pressures get great and the crisis comes and the difficulties come? What do you have to call upon? Well, if you know Jesus Christ, you don't have anything to worry about because when he lives in your heart he gives great inward peace and joy and assurance and a sense of safety and well-being when you come to Christ it affects you physically and mentally and socially every way every phase of your life is affected when Christ dominates your life because you let him come as Savior as well as law and then the second required course that you have at the university you're required to die now, we have been having a lot of studies on death lately. We read about Dr. Kubler-Ross and Dr. Rawlings and Dr. Moody and others and courses on thanatology in our universities are springing up all over the country teaching people about death and the classrooms are filled with students studying death. George Bernard Shaw said that there's one statistic that we can be sure of. Now, everybody in the gaming business here in Nevada ought to hear this. The odds against which no gambler can win that one out of every one dies. Now that's a sure thing. God said to Hezekiah, thou shalt die and not live. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. The Bible says there's a time to be born and a time to die. The number of years is simply relative. The fact is we all die. And the Bible says there's a day, there's an hour, there's a minute already appointed for your death. It may be tonight. It may be tomorrow morning. There's a day, there's an hour, there's a minute already appointed. The Bible says in Job 14, seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds beyond which he cannot pass. There's a moment beyond which you cannot live already appointed. And God is giving you this moment of grace right now to find Christ as your Lord and your Savior. That's the reason the Bible always says today, 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 harden not your heart. Now is the accepted time of salvation. The Bible is saying don't put it off. Tomorrow is the devil's word. Come while you can. There's only one man in history that didn't have to die and that was Jesus Christ. 
He said, no man taketh my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. He was perfect. He was free from sin and its effects, and yet he died on the cross. Why? Because he died for you. He took the things that caused death in your life on the cross in your place. He died for you. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. And now tonight, you come to that cross and surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And God says, forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. I forgive you. I write your name in the book of life. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. But not only did he die, he rose again. He's alive tonight. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. I haven't seen the picture, the raising of the Titanic, but I've read about it. And they're going to try to raise it next summer. And that's going to be a very interesting experiment. They're doing a similar thing off the coast of Japan where they found a, a Russian ship. And they think it may have $30 billion worth of gold in it. And they're after that gold. And it's going to be quite interesting to see who gets it when they finally get it all up. And uh, so there is a great deal of raising going on. But the Bible says there's coming a time when there's going to be a general resurrection. When all of those that are lost are going to be raised. And all of those that are saved are going to be raised. And Jesus Christ died on our a count on the cross was raised again and that is living proof he is living proof tonight that there's going to be a resurrection someday think of it Jesus Christ came back from the dead to tell us there's more because he lives I can face tomorrow the Bible says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death are you ready and then the third thing in this school that is required of you the judgment of God is required. You're going to face the judgment. There's a movie out called The Judgment, and someday you're going to give a moral accounting. The searching eyes of God will miss nothing in that day when you stand before him. Now the whole country's talking about who shot J.R. I'll tell you exactly who did it. A sinner. And someday, all the Ewing family and all the suspects are going to have to stand before God. Just like you are. And every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account in the day of judgment, the Bible says. Many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils. And Lord, we've done all these great things in your name. But the Bible says God is, Jesus is going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. You see, you can be in the church. Last night, a number of Catholic people came forward, and Episcopalian people, and people who have confirmation. I was confirmed myself when I was about 12 years of age in a, an associate reformed Presbyterian church. And I know what they meant when they came. They wanted to reconfirm their confirmation. What had they promised God in accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? And how many of you tonight need Christ? You need to come to him. You've been away from him. You're in the church. Your name is on the church roll, but you really don't know Christ. More than a third of the people that have been coming forward here to receive Christ have no church connections but nearly two-thirds do. Some of them are back east, and they haven't thought about the church since they've been in Reno, or in Nevada, or in Northern California, or wherever you may be. Come to Christ tonight, and receive him into your heart, and start all over again. Now those are the required courses. Life itself, you cannot be unborn. You're required to die. You're required to face the judgment. Now, there are certain options at the university tonight the university of life first you can choose your way of life the bible says choose you this day as i said a moment ago there is a way that seemeth right now some of those roads that seem right 
There's the lust of the eye the Bible talks about. Possessions. It seems that to gain all the possessions you can, there's nothing wrong with that, it seems. Things are not wrong, but when your life is centered in the acquisition of physical possessions, then the lust of the eyes has gotten the best of you. And that's sin. And it seems right, but it's wrong. And it leads to a dead end. Then there's the lust of the flesh. Those are the physical things which offer by way of luxury and entertainment. Some of us are selling our souls for sinful pleasure. Overeating, the wrong use of sex, excessive use of alcohol, all of these things. The scripture says, the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Then there's also the pride of life. That seems right. Ego, position, getting the best. Self-interest, but that's a wrong road. We ought to think something of ourselves. We're to love our neighbor as ourselves. We are to love ourselves because you cannot love your neighbor. You cannot be a true Christian without having a respect for yourself. And there's a certain love of self, but not this egocentric thing because the very heart of sin is selfishness. The very heart of sin is ego. And when you come to Christ, your ego has to be surrendered to Christ until he becomes law. And then secondly, not only can you choose your way of life, but you can choose who will be the master of your life. What's going to master your life? What philosophy are you giving your life to? What group are you giving your life to? Who is going to control you? Are you going to control your own life and make a wreck of it? Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. By nature, we want to run our own lives. We think we know better than even God knows. But God has a plan for your life. And his plan is perfect. For every young person here, God has a plan. He has the right person picked out for you to marry if you'd only trust him to help you. He has the right job for you, the right vocation for you. It's all planned. If you'll say, Lord, thy will be done, and you surrender to him and let him become involved in all the affairs of your life. Or some of you that are already married, or maybe you're older now. And your life is all messed up. Did you know that God can rearrange your life after you've messed it up by forgiving your sin? Now, he can't take those scars away of sin. I've watched people come forward here. And I've seen many of them as they stood in front of this platform night after night. I've seen them with sin-scarred faces because sin leaves its mark. But God can forgive all that and he can take all that mess that you've made in your life and straighten it all out and get you back on the right road if you'll trust him. You say, well, Billy, suppose I've been divorced in my remarried and my life is all what what'll happen well you can't unscramble eggs but you can start from where you are by trusting Christ where you are he'll forgive the past and give you a whole new spiritual life and give you a power beyond anything you ever dreamed and a love and a joy and a peace don't let the devil worry you about past sins once you've been to the cross if your son asks for bread will you give him a snake no, God loves you. He has a plan for you. And you ask for something good, he's not going to give you a snake, says the scripture, said Jesus. The rich young ruler, the problem with him was not his wealth, but he wanted to control his own life. And many of you want to control your own life. You see, we want to run our own lives. Suppose I'd go up in the airliner and tell the pilot, I want to pilot this plane. I've never piloted a plane in my life. I can take over from you. No. God says, get up out of that seat. You're making a wreck of your life. You're heading toward destruction. Let me take the controls of your life. I've been over the road before. Let me help you. And then lastly, you can choose your own destination. The destination is heaven or hell. 
The Bible says, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Narrow is the gate and hard is the way which leadeth unto life. What are we to do? What can you do tonight to make your peace with God? The Bible says, prepare to meet God. Well, how do you prepare? First, by repentance. Repentance means that you're willing to let God change your life. It means that you change your mind so much that it changes the way you live. And you're willing to give up all those things that are sinful in your life and turn over to Jesus Christ, your life. The second thing, you come by faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, says the Bible. Just believe. You say, well, there must be a catch somewhere. There is. That word believe means that you put your total confidence in. You don't put your confidence in your own works. You don't put your confidence in anything but the person of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you. You cannot work your way. You cannot pay your way. You come by simple childlike faith. And then the third thing, you must be willing to be a disciple or a follower of Christ. Earlier in the year, it was my privilege to hold a 10-day mission at Cambridge University in England, as well as Oxford University. And I could not help but remember that young man at Cambridge who made this statement when he gave his life to Christ. He was the son of a very wealthy man, and he was one of the greatest cricketers that Cambridge has ever had. He said, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice that I can make for him can be too great. That was C.T. Studd who said that. And he went out as a missionary with the Cambridge Seven that started a whole missionary movement at the end of the last century. Jim Elliott, who was killed by the Alka Indians in South America as a young student, wrote this. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I ask you young and old alike tonight, do you know Christ? Is he your Lord and your Savior? In a few moments, I'm going to ask you to do something very difficult. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform as we saw over 500 last night do. And stand here and say by coming symbolically, I open my heart to Christ. I want him to forgive my sins and change my life. I want to know where I'm going. I want to know what life is all about and I want fulfillment in my life. I ask you to come publicly because every person Jesus called in the Bible, he called publicly. I ask you to come publicly because there's a psychological and a biblical reason for you to come. You stand here a moment and after you've come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with all of you and then give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. There's something about coming forward like that that settles it and seals it. You that are in the other auditorium where we were a moment ago, where thousands of people are gathered, you come forward in your auditorium where you are. Grady Wilson will be there to say a word and to help you. And many counselors are there as well. And then you that are watching by television, you pick up the phone right now and call the number on your screen. Don't let this moment pass because there may never be another moment quite like this in your life when you're so close to the kingdom of God and all it needs is a, is a phone call to talk to someone. And then if you don't get through immediately, wait a moment or two and call again. Wait five minutes or 10 minutes, call again. But don't let this night pass. Those people, some of them will be there for several hours to answer your phone. You get up and come right here as people are making their decisions here and in the other auditorium and all over America right now. You join them and come and stand here and say yes to Christ. We're going to wait on you. You may be in the choir. You may be a leader in the church. Or you may not have any church connections. Whoever you are, God has spoken to you. Get up and come. We're going to wait on you. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. 
Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. You that are watching by television can see that many scores of people, I suppose hundreds of people, are coming to make this commitment here in Reno, Nevada. You can make that same commitment right now where you are. Just pick up the phone and call that number that's on your screen and have a talk with that counselor and tell them what you want to do. Or make the decision right where you are. Maybe your circumstances are such you cannot call right now. All right, make your commitment now. Bow your head and say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll-free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. I want to turn tonight to the second chapter of John's Gospel, beginning with the 23rd verse. Now when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now, when you hear about Christ and all the great things that he did, you may believe on him. You may believe in him. But Jesus knows your heart, and when he sees your heart, he will not commit himself to you. Now, the question I want to ask is, has Christ committed himself to you? Because your heart has been cleansed of sin. Then it goes on into the next chapter. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. This literally, in its original language, means born from above. It's born anew. It's a new beginning. And I want to ask you, have you ever longed to start life over? Or like the psalmist, have you ever said, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me? Have you ever thought to yourself, I'd like to start it all over again? Now, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus, had been in that crowd that Jesus would not commit himself to them. He knew their hearts, and he knew that they had never been born again. And Nicodemus was one of them, and he was a great religious leader. And he came to Jesus at night, and he wanted to ask some spiritual questions. Now, he was not only a great religious leader, but... Uh, he, he did many things that you and I don't do in his religion. And he wanted to have some more thought before committing himself. Now, searching is important. 
searching for purpose and meaning in your life, for psychological and philosophical questions, but it no, does no good unless you search in the right place. And the right place is to search in the Bible, the Word of God, and come to Jesus. I heard about a 10-year-old boy that was writing a thesis, and uh, he went to his grandmother, and he was writing on birth, and he said, Grandmother, how were you born? And she said, a stork brought me. She went to his mother, and he said, Mother, how were you born? She said, a stork brought me. Then he said, well, how was I born? She said, a stork brought you. And he started his thesis this way. There hasn't been a natural birth in our family in three generations. <laughs> now the scripture says, we have to be born again. And how do you become born again? What does that mean? Nicodemus must have been stunned. Nicodemus was a ruler. He was rich, he was religious, but he was searching for reality. Now he fasted two days a week. He spent two hours daily in prayer. He gave 10% of all of his income to this temple. He was a professor of theology. He worked hard at religion. But Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, that's not enough. You must be born again if you are to even see the kingdom of God. Now, why did Jesus say this? Why did he say you must be born again? because he knew what was in the hearts of people. What causes lying, cheating, hate, prejudice, greed, injustice, selfishness, cruelty, jealousy, perversion, ultimately war? What causes it? Jesus said those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile a man. Now, psychologists and sociologists and historians realize that something's wrong with the human race. And if we don't find out what's wrong pretty soon and straighten it out, we may end up in a nuclear war that could destroy this planet. What is it? What's wrong? The Bible tells us. The Bible says the thing that is wrong is that we have a disease. It affects the whole human race all over the world and the disease is called sin. Notice I said sin, singular, and from the singular, which is the disease, come all of the sins of jealousy and hate and lust and greed and all the rest, which ends up in war, war in a community, war in a family, war in your own heart, war in the world. Now where did the sin come from? This sin came from the fact that God created you in His image. You have a body, but living down inside your body is your spirit, your soul. And that's the part of you that can have fellowship with God and did have fellowship with God. And God said that if you will obey me and serve me and live for me, we'll build this wonderful world together. But man broke God's law. Man rebelled against God, and his first child was named Cain, and Cain became jealous and killed his brother Abel. That was the beginning of all the wars of history, and that sin that was in Cain's heart that he inherited from his mother and father Adam and Eve has been passed from generation to generation to generation to generation down to you and me. All have sinned, the Bible says. Everybody has sinned. Billy Graham is a sinner. You are a sinner. And sin is very serious in the sight of God. Because the result of sin, the penalty of sin is death. Physical death, we all know about. But it's spiritual death. You can be alive right now physically, but your soul is dead. Your spirit is dead and you keep searching for something and you can't find it. You don't know what it is. You can't find it in money. You can't find it in drugs. You can't find it in sex. You can't find it in all of these other substitutes. You'll never find what you're looking for in life till you come to the cross of Christ and are born again. So what is this business of the new birth? Nicodemus asked that question. He said, how can a person be born when he's old? He wanted to understand it intellectually. The Bible says that the preaching of the cross is foolishness. Foolishness. Idiotic. 
There's no way that our little finite minds can understand all there is to know about the great God who is from everlasting to everlasting. And there's no way that we can understand all that happened at the cross when the Jesus Christ died and said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The Bible tells us that God at that moment was laying on him all of our sins, all of our hell, all of our judgment. He took it on the cross. So how do we find it? We cannot come intellectually alone. Now, there are a lot of things that I don't understand. I was watching some cows graze today out in the country. And I don't understand how a black cow can eat green grass and produce white milk and yellow butter. But they do. I don't understand color television or the satellites or the computers. Now, how do you go about proving a mother's love in a laboratory? Nicodemus could see only the physical and the material, and Jesus was speaking about something spiritual. He had already been born physically, but he had not been born spiritually. You have to be born twice, physically and spiritually. Now, you can't inherit it, and it's not by works, not by works of righteousness, which we've done according to his, but according to his mercy, he saved us. You can reform yourself, but that's not it. Or you cannot imitate Christ. People say, oh, I try to imitate Christ. I live by the Sermon on the Mountain, the Golden Rule. Isn't that good enough? No, that's not good enough. We had, uh, I heard about a couple of many years ago that uh, were living in Oklahoma and they said they were going to go to New York and they told all their friends they were going to New York. And while in New York, they were going to go see My Fair Lady with Rex Harris. And so uh, they got to New York, but they found out it was sold four or five months in advance. But they told all their friends and they were embarrassed. So they went and stood in front of the theater wondering what they would do. And when all the people had gone in, they went up and bought one of the books. They told all about it and all the pictures in it. And then they saw people coming along and tearing the tickets up afterward and dropping it in the wastebasket or dropping it even on the street. They picked up some torn tickets and they went home. Now they had everything. They had the tickets, they had the program, and they could sing. I could have danced all night or on the street where she lives in one of the songs out of My Fair Lady. And everybody thought that they had been to see my fair lady. The only trouble was they hadn't. They had everything but the real thing. And that's the way many of us are. We have everything but the real thing. Ezekiel says, a new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. The apostle Paul sp speaks of being alive from the dead. In 2 Corinthians, he calls it a new creation. Old things pass away and everything becomes new. In Peter, Peter says, being partakers of the divine nature. John calls it passing from death unto life. The new birth brings about a change of heart, a change of spirit that influences our way of thinking, our way of living, our attitudes, as well as our actions. It determines our destiny. How is it accomplished? Jesus said it's a mystery. He said it's like the wind. You can see the evidences of the wind. The wind is blowing, but you can't see the wind itself. And there's the analogy of natural birth. You see, there's the moment of gestation, of, uh, pardon me, of conception. Then there's the months of gestation. Then there's actual birth. And with many of you, you might have had conception, or you may be in some stage of gestation, but you haven't been born yet. And you need to be born. And how does that happen? The Bible tells us, first of all, there must be the reception to the word of God. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the apostle Paul said in first Corinthians, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. Now, doesn't it sound strange and foolish to you that a man can stand up here? and talk about Jesus Christ and your life can be changed by that message? Isn't that foolish? Well, that's what the Bible says about it. It's foolish. 
That's the reason you come by simple childlike faith, as we heard a moment ago, like a little child. Jesus said, unless you come as a little child and be converted, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And then it's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts us. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and righteousness and judgment, the Bible says. You cannot come to Christ unless you are made uncomfortable by the Holy Spirit and he shows you that you've sinned. You cannot come to Christ unless he draws you to the cross. And he may use a mother's prayers. He may use a tragic experience. He may use the sermon of a clergyman or he may use the example of some wonderful person that you know or maybe he'll use a little tract of some sort that somebody gives out i remember the meeting the surgeon general of portugal and he told me that he was walking down the street one day and he picked up a piece of paper on his shoe and when he got to his house he took the piece of paper off and it was a little tract on how to find christ and he said he'd never read anything like that in his life. And he read it and he studied it and he read it and he studied it and got him a Bible and studied some of those verses. And he was born again and he became a Bible teacher. He became a wonderful proclaimer of the gospel just through the reading the word of God. It gives new life. The Bible says that we're dead in sin. And you hath he made alive who were dead in trespasses and in sin. Man needs new life. He needs to be born from above. What about you? Man without God is dead. And life is at best a bore. And it's soon over. And the moment you give your life to Christ, he indwells. And I will put my spirit within you. The scripture says he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. When you leave here tonight after you've received Christ into your heart, you don't leave alone. We sang that song when we come in the Shankly Gates every night. There's that little inscription that says you'll never be alone. You'll never walk alone. Christ goes with you. The Spirit of God goes with you to help you to live the Christian life. There's nobody here, including me, that can live the Christian life. I cannot live it. It's too much for me. But Christ can live it through me, and he can give me the strength to produce by the Holy Spirit love and joy and peace and long-suffering and all the fruit of the Spirit. Know you not that you're the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, the Bible says? He gives you a new power in your life, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Power to love, power to resist the temptations in life. In Wakefield, England, some time ago, I read about a woman who tried her driver's test for the 38th time and failed. And perhaps you've tried nearly that many times for a license spiritually to sit in the driver's seat of your own life I'm asking you to move over and trust the Holy Spirit to drive and control your life. Do you know Christ? Are you sure? You see, when Christ died on the cross, he died for you. And God says, I'll forgive your sins. I'll give you eternal life. You can start life all over again, even if you're 70 years of age or 100 years old. But come while you're young. If you're a young person, you ought to run to Christ. Because you see, the Bible says, Remember now thy creator on the days of thy youth. The Bible calls young people especially to come to him.